Welcome to the first of a three-part series called Comic Book and Dinosaurs. Now, dinosaurs are undeniably awesome. They are amongst the coolest animals that ever existed. And if you were to ask anyone to make a list of their top 10 favorite cool and awesome things, and that person did not include dinosaurs on the list, you would be quite justified in dismissing that person as obviously insane, because dinosaurs are just that awesome. And through the years, uh, comic book writers have recognized just how awesome dinosaurs are, and they have never stinted on the opportunity to insert dinosaurs into a comic book story, if at all possible, regardless of the time period that, uh, that that story was set in, and regardless of the theme. If they can include a dinosaur, it's always a good thing. And one magnificent example of that is Turok, Son of Stone, which was first published in 1954 and had a good 20-year run before it finally ended. The main characters in this book are two pre-Columbian Indians named Turok and Andar, who get trapped in a valley somewhere in the American Southwest. It's a valley surrounded by uh, impassable cliffs, so they're always looking for a way out, never quite finding it. And what makes the valley particularly dangerous is that it's populated by dinosaurs and other prehistoric creatures. Now, Turok and Andar, in their very first adventure, discover a way of, co of coating their arrows with a uh, deadly poison that effectively makes their bows and arrows a uh, weapon of mass destruction against the dinosaurs. But there's a lot of dinosaurs. And there's also any number of primitive tribes living in the valley that can often be just as dangerous as the dinosaurs are. So Turok and Andar have to stay on their toes constantly if they're going to survive from one day to the next. Now, that's very apparent in this issue. This is Turok, Son of Stone, number 80, published in 1972. And in this story, right from the beginning, we can say that, see that Turok and Andar are having a really bad day. And that top frame there, that half-page frame of the uh, carnosaur stalking them through the woods, is a really good one. Uh, the writer here is Alberto Gioletti, and I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that name. I've seen it written a million times, but I don't think I've ever actually heard it spoken aloud. But he was uh, uh, one of the regular artists for Turok, and he did great jungles and great forests. He, he did a lot of detail in the foregrounds and the backgrounds, and he always made you believe that what you were looking at was a real place. And that's very apparent in this story, both in this opening scene and in the action that takes place at the end of the story when Andar is trying to rescue Turok from a dangerous tribe. Um, here, they can't get a clear shot at this dinosaur. There's too many branches around, and they're not able to put an arrow in it as it comes closer and closer to them. And as you see in the last panel of this page, things go from bad to worse when a uh, tree falls on Turok and traps him underneath. But uh, this actually gives uh, Andar an opportunity to circle around the dinosaur while it's focused on Turok. Turok looks like he's just an easy free lunch here. And Andar finally gets a clear shot at the monster, and he's able to get an arrow into it and kill it. So uh, Andar and Turok are safe for the moment, but only just barely. Their archery skills weren't quite good enough in this situation, or rather they were only barely good enough. Turok realizes that. And the next morning, while Andar's taking a bath in the river, Turok is practicing his archery. And he insists that Andar does the same. He tries to have Andar shoot a piece of fruit out of a tall tree. And Andar's not quite skilled enough to be able to do it. Turok shows him how it's done, but he refuses to share the fruit with Andar until the younger Indian can get some archery practice in. Now, it's important to note here that Turok's not being mean, he's not being arrogant, he's not simply being a jerk when he does this. He is the father figure or mentor in this relationship, and it's his job to make sure that Andar has the skills that they both need if they're going to survive until they find a way out of this valley. So he's doing what he needs to do in order to get Andar's butt into gear. And Andar does start practicing. Um, he starts to make hits on difficult shots. Turok does the same. And after a bunch of practice, when Turok feels that they're now good enough, they continue their search for a way out of the valley. Now, not long after that, they find a line made in some sort, with some sort of white dirt 
uh, just drawn across the ground. It seems to be random. Turok bends down out of curiosity to examine it and to touch it, and as soon as he does this, a tribe of uh, native men pop out of the bushes and threaten them with boomerangs. It turns out that the medicine man claims this is a magic line that keeps the dinosaurs from crossing over and attacking them. Um, and because Turok has touched the line, he's broken the magic, and now they have to be punished because of this. Now this tribe threatens them with boomerangs, and that's a nice touch. Um, the writer of this story, as it has, uh, 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 and the writer of most Turok stories, was Paul Newman. Now, no, it's not that Paul Newman. It's a Paul Newman who was an extraordinarily prolific comic book writer during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And he was a superb storyteller. And on Turok, he had a real talent for being able to, amongst other tricks, give the various tribes they would encounter each its own unique attribute so that it wouldn't just be the same story over and over again. Each one would have its unique feel. In this case, it's giving boomerangs to the natives. And on the next page, we are shown that these boomerangs aren't just toys, but they are actually dangerous weapons. Um, I love that panel in the middle right there. The, uh, the, the bad guys have just thrown a boomerang at a bird, and Andar's looking grossed out while Turok is looking really grim, as they mentioned that the boomerang actually cut the bird's head clean off. And it's a way of telling us that these boomerangs are deadly weapons and that uh, Turok and Ander need to be concerned with them without grossing us out. We don't need to see a bird get decapitated and they don't, the, the story doesn't try to show us that. It just tells us we, what we need to know and it uses the reaction of the two Native Americans there very effectively to bring across the emotion that we need. Well, they make a break for it, but Turok is hit in the leg with, by a boomerang, and he tells Andar to keep going, because if Andar is still free, then there's a chance he can later uh, uh, get Turok free as well. That ends the first half of the story, and the second half starts off with another great half-page panel that shows us uh, just how difficult it is to take Turok prisoner. They've actually got to overwhelm him as he's just knocking him right and left there. Turok's one tough guy and he's one awesome guy. He's always been a favorite character of mine and that's one reason why. He doesn't look for a fight. He's not a violent man at all. He's a good moral man. But if he's got a fight, by golly, he'll hand you your, your butt uh, pretty easily because he's pretty good at fighting. Anyway, Andor runs off into the woods and in the meantime Turok is strung up as a sacrifice to the next hungry dinosaur that comes along. The Metis Man is saying that the sac this sacrifice will appease the dinosaurs after the magic of the lion has been broken. And so that's what they have to do next. Now by now, it's obvious that the medicine man is just making this stuff up as he goes along. It's his way of maintaining his power over the tribe. He claims to have these magic powers. If something doesn't work, he immediately finds something other than himself to blame it on and come up with a solution for fixing it. And that way he maintains his power. Now, Andar's in the jungle and he can see what's going on but he's spotted by a guard and he barely gets away without being himself decapitated by a boomerang. And that re requires him to run farther into the woods, so he's farther than ever away from Turok when a big meat eater comes out of the jungle and, um, looking for a dinner. So that means that uh, Andar has to make a long distance shot. Gee, it's good they've been practicing their archery recently, isn't it? And that is an, admittedly a contrived part of this story. They spent several pages practicing trick shots and practicing their archery, and then they're immediately thrust into a situation where the skills they've been practicing are needed in order to save their lives. Um, but it doesn't bother me, because this action sequence is a great one. Uh, from the moment that Turok is captured and Andar starts struggling to find a way to help him, the action flows well. Uh, the artist, Giolatti, uh, uh, shifts the camera angle back and forth using uh, close-ups and using long shots uh, in order to keep uh, a sense of motion to the whole thing. He choreographs the action very well so that we always understand what's going on. We always understand the tactical situation, so to speak. Uh, he just is a great visual storyteller. And as I mentioned before, his jungles just look magnificent. That right-hand page, the middle panel, that's a great jungle. Uh, it's got a lot of detail, both in the foreground and in the background, and it makes you think of this as a real place. Anyway, Tura, uh, Andar rather makes the shot, 
kills the dinosaur. There's a nice touch here where the uh, medicine man immediately jumps out and claims that it's his magic that killed the dinosaur, and he hides the arrow so that nobody can see that. Um, he's just a jerk, who just uh, just a con artist, really, who claims to have magic in order to maintain a, his power base over the tribe. Um, well, that distracts them from looking for Andar, um, and, but it also leaves them out in the open near Turok, so Andar just can't run out and cut Turok free. So he's got to try and get closer before he can do anything, but there's that guard that almost got him earlier. He pulls the old, old trick of throwing a stone to distract the guard and then jumps him. Uh, that throwing a stone to distract the, distract the guard thing, gee, how many times has that been done in fiction? That's, I'll bet you if you could possibly count it, it'd be over a thousand times in various stories. So it's kind of a cliche, but at the same time, when you think about it, it's a trick that would always work, wouldn't it? There's no way it would not work. If you're standing guard and you hear a noise over to your right, then of course you're going to look over to the right and investigate it. You have to. It's your job. You're a guard. So uh, the trick works here. Tur uh, Andar jumps the guard. There's a bit of a tussle. And he, he's able to stun the guard with his bow, and, but he still can't run out into the open to uh, free Turok. He's closer now, but the other tribesmen are out there. So what's he going to do? He has to make a really, uh, really good arrow shot here. He has to shoot the ropes uh, off of Turok from a distance. And it's a dangerous move because if he misses, he's as likely to kill his best friend and his mentor as he is to free him. So he makes the shot. Uh, it's apparently a very, very, very slow arrow because there's an awful lot of dialogue going on here while that arrow's flying through the air. But I think that's an acceptable break from reality because uh, they were t the writer and the artist were taking the opportunity here to build up suspense. They wanted us on the edge of our seat. Gosh, is this arrow going to hit Turok or is it going to free him? Um, what's going to happen next? So if it happened too quickly, it would lose that sense of suspense. Now, of course, the arrow does cut the rope. Turok is free. Uh, you'll notice that the bad guys never bothered to take his bow and arrow away. That just seems like a silly thing. It's like not taking uh, Batman's utility belt from him when you put him in a death trap. But uh, it also can be argued that they simply wouldn't have recognized the bow and arrow as a weapon and didn't borrow, uh, bother with it. But regardless, he's free now. He's running towards the jungle. Uh, the natives follow him. But Andar is able to make one more good trick shot by shooting his arrow between the legs of the medicine man and tripping him. Um, that gives Andar and Turok a chance to get away into the jungle. And I kind of like that touch. Andar probably would have been perfectly justified morally in shooting the medicine man. It would have been self-defense and defense of his friend. Uh, but he took a non-lethal option instead. Um, it, it goes into the theme of them having practiced their archery later, so there's that. But I also like the fact that neither Turok or Andar are bloodthirsty. They will kill to defend themselves, they'll kill animals, and they'll fight other people to defend themselves. But if they're not absolutely forced to, they're not going to kill somebody else. Um, in the meantime, that guard that Andar knocked out a few minutes ago is starting to wake up. He beans uh, Andar with a, uh, a, a boomerang and he's going to throw another one to finish Andar off and that gives Turok a chance to do a trick shot as he actually has to shoot the boomerang out of the air in order to save Andar. He does so uh, and the two get away and the next morning um, Andar is practicing his archery. He's learned his lesson, hasn't he? Well, that's Native Americans Meet Dinosaurs, which is an awesome concept in itself. In part two, we'll look at an easily, e, um, easily equally um, uh, uh, awesome concept, as we'll see World War II versus dinosaurs, which, you know, that's just awesome in of itself. So part two will be coming soon. In the meantime, you can visit me at my blog, comics, old-time radio, and other cool stuff. Thank you for listening.